Uh, tonight, as we can see, we want to look at God's truth. But we also want to consider what is truth in, in general. Then we'll look at what God's truth is, how we can obtain God's truth, and what the, uh, the importance of God's truth is to us in this hall and indeed around the world. Now, we had for our reading there from uh, the Gospel of, of John, we'd read that Jesus was taken before the Jewish leaders and was trialed, tried rather, and false accusers were brought before him because the Jews there were envious of the Lord Jesus Christ. They felt that he was blasphemous because he made himself the Son of God, yet he proved to be the Son of God by the miracles that he did. So it was for envy that the Jewish leaders didn't want to see Jesus progressing any further and to limit his effect amongst the people. So they'd already made their own judgment upon him. But then he was taken then to the Roman governor at the time, Pontius Pilate, to get his sentence passed upon him. And we've read this dialogue, didn't we? That um, Jesus says that he was born to be king of the Jews. And he says that, particularly regarding the truth, he says, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, it isn't in the Greek, it's the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And the voice that he was speaking was the words of God from the Old Testament scriptures. And he speaks about the truth as being the truth. There's only one truth as far as Jesus was concerned. It was the Son of God and it was the Word of God. But Pilate says to him, well, what is truth? What is truth in general? Because he was faced with a dilemma, didn't he? Jesus, on the one hand, stated that he had the truth and he was speaking God's truth. But then he had all the, the high priest, the Jewish leaders, on the other hand, saying that he was actually blasphemous and he shouldn't be, shouldn't be kept upon the earth anymore, he should be, should be destroyed, should be crucified. So Pilate rightly says, well, what is truth? Do I believe Jesus? Do I believe you? Do I believe either of you? When he examined him, it was a matter of religious uh, matters and that didn't bother Pilate at all. So he says, uh, I find no fault in him. Nothing that would cause any issues for the Roman uh, leaders. Except the problem was, that the Jewish leaders were stirring up trouble. They wanted to get rid of Jesus, and if it was causing trouble to the people, it would then be brought to the attention of the Romans, and Pontius Pilate would be liable for that uprising. So clearly he was in a mind, he would like to release Jesus, but it would cause a wrong uproar amongst the Jewish authorities, and therefore he was minded not to release him. Now Matthew has a similar record that we read there about the releasing of a prisoner at the, uh, the Jewish feast time of Passover. And, and Pilate is almost goading the people. He says, who shall I release unto you? Well, clearly Jesus was not the favourite uh, person that they wanted to be released. So they said, you know, who do you want? But Matthew has this, he said, he knew that for envy they delivered him up. So Pilate really, I think, knew where both parties were coming from. He could see that Jesus had done nothing wrong. Whether he'd heard of the miracles and the teachings of Jesus, we don't know. But when he was quizzed by Jesus, am I a king? Do you think I'm a king? He said, am I a Jew? Do I really care? I don't think he did particularly. But he didn't care for the attitude of the Jewish believer, uh, leaders either. So he said, he was giving them a choice. Do you want Barabbas or Jesus? And the people were stirred up by the authorities, release Barabbas. So what is truth? Well, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? And men have debated what is truth throughout the centuries. But if we take man's viewpoint, well, what is truth? Just putting the Bible aside for a moment. Well, man is fallible, isn't he? How do you know if man is speaking the truth? Sometimes he's speaking in honesty, sometimes he's speaking in dishonesty. And we saw the Jewish leaders, they were bringing false charges against the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a bias amongst man's thinking. But also, from month to month, we can have various um, medical discoveries and and we can say that one month that eggs, for example, are bad for you, and then sometime later it's discovered that they're actually good for you. But it's all done in truth, but the truth can change as man gets greater knowledge of various things. So I think we can say that there can be no absolute truth when it comes from man's viewpoint. Man can speak the truth as he thinks it is truth, but it could change in future depending on future knowledge. And we've seen with the debate before Pilate that truth is often traded as a commodity. Was Jesus the Son of God? Well, he claimed to be, but he claimed to be by miracle. So it would be a fair assumption that he was the Son of God, but they didn't believe that. 
and they said it was, he was wrong, he was blasphemous, and therefore he wasn't telling the truth. So truth, then, is something that uh, it can be traded depending upon your viewpoint. Now, we've had recently the, uh, the Brexit debate, haven't we, in this country? And what was truth then? Well, we've got a few headlines, which I think probably most of are familiar with. The EU referendum said the independent, let's hear it for a man who dared to tell the truth about Brexit. What was his, uh, his claim? Well, he was vilified for actually telling the truth about something that might happen if we did leave Brexit, that wages might actually go up. It was a truth, but one side didn't want you to hear that. So we can see how truth is a commodity, isn't it? It's depending where you're coming from. The Guardian says, the people have spoken on Brexit, but did the media tell them the truth? Now, the truth is important if it's not what your opinion is. If people are, have, uh, are speaking according to your opinion, then you're happy with it, aren't you? But if somebody says something that you disagree with that, then you say they're not telling the truth. So truth is a commodity, isn't it, to be bought and sold? Again, the Express, brilliant moment, they said, when Weatherspoon's boss tells UK exactly why the PM is not telling the truth on Brexit. So the media has a, a very important role to play, doesn't it? It can colour viewpoints, can't it? But depending which newspaper you read, whether you're left-wing or right-wing, depends what the truth is going to be. And finally there, we, finally there, we have probably the most, um, what should we say, the most rancorous debate in the politics of throughout the, the Brexit period that Michael Gove was, was all for Boris Johnson, but when he came to it, he turned from him. And some of like into Judas that we've read about tonight. We can see how, how the truth is, really is, depends on your viewpoint, doesn't it? It's Gove, he says. So we ask the question then, from man's point of view, what is truth? Well, it's what people want you to believe, whether you want to remain in the, in the, in the EU or whether you want to leave the EU. But it's also... The truth can be, well, what do you want to believe? People will believe what they want to believe, don't they? So the truth, as far as man's concerned, like I say, it can't be absolute. It is not the truth in the sense that that is the final say, that what is said is truth and there is another viewpoint. When we get to God's truth, I thought Napoleon made an interesting comment. Man will believe anything as long as it's not in the Bible. And many people this day and age don't believe in the Bible I would like to think that it's not true. But just because man says it's not true, as we've seen, doesn't mean to say that it isn't true, does it? It depends on your, on your viewpoint. So truth needs to be measured against something that can be validated. And the only thing I believe that can be validated is from the biblical point of view. What is truth? Well, it originates from God's word, which we read tonight. It's recorded in his word. We believe God's infallible. We won't go through the reason why we believe that tonight, but many lectures we've done from this platform have shown that Bible prophecy, archaeology, many of the things you can prove the veracity and the truth of the scriptures that will give us confidence. And therefore, if God's infallible, then his truth is absolute and can be believed. This, I believe, is truth. We'll just bring up a few scriptures. When Moses, the leader of the Jewish people, was going to be bringing the people out of Egypt... He wanted some assurance from God that God was able to perform the things that he could. He wanted to see God's glory. What was God's glory? I want to see your power. I want something that I'll be confident with when I bring the people out of, out of Egypt. And God appeared before uh, Moses in, in a cloud. He, he was, his presence was veiled from, from him. But he heard the words and he said, The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth. The truth is important to God. And sometime later, when Joshua is going to bring the people into the promised land, he encourages and exhorts the people, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods, which by definition are false gods, which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord, the true God. But you notice, sincerity is good, you have been sincere in what we believe, but it has to be based on truth. You can live a good life, as many Christians would say, but whether you believe the word of God its entirety, in, in, in entirety rather, then, you know, that is up for, up for debate. But this isn't what the Bible says. In sincerity and in truth. 
Let's turn up the scripture, if you would, please. Isaiah chapter 8. We're just going to get emphasise the importance of this word, why it must be believed and understood, if it is to be proved that it's the word of God. Because if it's not the word of God, then it's the word of man. And if it's the word of man, then how do you know it can be true? Because we've seen that man can't always be trusted or be sure that he has the truth himself. There were many prophets in the times of Isaiah that uh, this, this verse comes from. And people were seeking different forms of truth from, as it says in, in verse 19 there, the people sought to familiar spirits, to wizards, soothsayers, fortune tellers, we might say, in this day and age. And they wanted to seek about God. But what does Isaiah say? He says, to the law, which is the, the Old Testament before us, and to the testimony, the truth of God's word, if anybody speaks not, if they speak not according to this word, if they don't do that, then it's because there is no light in them. The Bible is quite clear. There is truth or there is error. There is black, there is darkness, or there is light. And it can't be made any more clear here. We're either speaking the truth from God's word or we're not. And that's the test. If I speak to you tonight and I don't prove what I'm saying from scripture, then how do you know what I'm telling the truth? I might be earnest, I might be sincere, but is it the truth? And it's the truth that matters. Look at John chapter 12, the words of Jesus, picking up the idea of, of light and the truth and the importance of God's word. Every time the Lord Jesus spoke to the disciples, spoke to the people, it was always his words, which were the words of God. Never his words, he said, but the words which God gave him. I just want to read this, this short section here, John 12, 46. I'll put it on the screen as well while we're doing it. Jesus says, I have come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. And what's the judge? The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him, in the last day. So we see again, it's not what you believe, it's whether it's according to the scriptures. It's according to the word of God. The words of Jesus, which were the words from God. And that's the judgment. The scriptures are clear that there will be a judgment seat. It's based upon the things that you've done and whether it's been done in accordance with the words of God. Sincerity is good, but without truth, it's nothing. Come the judgment day. Well, it's been said, well, yes, you follow the Bible, but there are many Christian denominations all around the world. The Catholics number 1.2 billion. Surely they've got the truth. There's more of them than there are of you, Christadelphians. Well, again, we'd say from all these denominations, which one's got the truth? Should you ask them? Or should you test their words, as I, as I said, if they speak not according to this word, then there is no light in them. So we say, if you're trying to find truth, we need to search out God's word. And then he can measure it against ourselves and any of, the, of these uh, dominations behind me and prove whether they are the truth or not. One technique to find the truth is to follow the words itself. Jesus, when he was debating amongst those leaders amongst him, appealed to scripture and said, the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus thought that the words of God were true and therefore could be relied upon. The scripture cannot be broken. So whatever debate we have, it's according to the scriptures. Again, the, the Apostle Paul, right into the, the Corinthians, he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. The New King, the New King James Version there, it's got the translation there, who is from God. The definite article of the person is not in there. So it is the spirit of God, which is God's power, which we, we can prove at another time. But the point I'm trying to make here is, is that the apostles, when they're coming, they're not using man's philosophy to, to prove the point, to preach the gospel. They're using what the spirit gift has given us, which is the words of God, the Old Testament. And obviously the time Paul was writing, he was forming the New Testament. So the Old Testament it clearly is important. But how does he prove the truth? He says, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. 
So how can we know we've got the truth in? What makes us different from anybody else? Not just as a group, but as a person. How do you know you've got the truth? Well, there are, there are a few techniques we can, we, which we can use based upon what we saw there from, from Jesus and from the, uh, the Apostle Paul. There are five things which we can do to test whether we've got the truth or not from the Scriptures. The first one there is to interpret Scripture language in its normal linguistic sense. In other words, read what it says, try to understand the actual translation of it as it is written in the book before us. Obviously, we need to take into account any figures of speech. For example, if we go to the book of Revelation, it speaks about beasts having seven heads and ten horns. Clearly, that is a figure of speech. We've never seen these creatures, and it's done for a reason. And in fact, the book tells us that these are figures of speech in the very first few verses of Revelation. So, read the words as it is on the page. Don't try to interpret what you think it's saying, but just read the words. This one might seem obvious, but so many people ignore the Old Testament, they begin with the New Testament, and then work their way backwards. Well, I've never read any book, even man's book, where you start at the end and go to the beginning. Unless you want to know the answer of a whodunit. But you would start at the beginning, wouldn't you? And God's logic, he builds up a amount of revelation, page by page, book by book, throughout, until finally, when you get to the book of Revelation, a book of symbol, you've been given all the symbols in the rest of the book, and therefore you can rightly interpret the book of Revelation. But many people got the book of Revelation and then go to the, new, uh, the beginning of the Old Testament and try to interpret scripture that way. It doesn't work. It's not being designed that way. So we've read through something. We'll go through an example in a moment. So we think we've got an opinion, which is just correct from scripture. But then we need to look at the context. Because there's many religions that I've come across where a number of verses that are picked out that suits a person's viewpoint. But when you compare it with the context... It doesn't quite stack up. So you think what they're saying, well, that's not really what the context is giving us. So we need to check our assumptions by the, uh, the local surrounding context. But then we can't just say, use the New Testament and ignore the Old Testament. Whatever we find in the New Testament, we'd be able to balance it by a look at the Old Testament as well. And by comparing scripture with scripture, spiritual things with spiritual things, as the Apostle Paul said, then we begin to understand the truth. What if you get two of these things right and it, it, you have a, an opinion in your own mind, two of these three rules work for you, but perhaps the third one doesn't quite fit with your viewpoint. Should we ignore the rest of them? No, we need to rigorously go through each of these phases and if we do that, we can get the truth. And we can't stress enough, if we haven't got the truth, and when it comes to the judgment seat, when Jesus Christ returns to the earth, establishes his kingdom, he'll judge everybody, whether they're going to get eternal life or not eternal life, on the words of the scripture. So it's very important that we understand the words of the scripture. Let's look at an example then. Let's, let's work through it. That was quite heavy, but I think I want to just labour the point here that we must look at the scripture and we can understand the truth of the scripture. It's not difficult. It can be time consuming, but I think eternal life is worth it. So Matthew 5 verse 12, commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? Jesus says there, Rejoice in verse 12 and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Now this passage is used that the reward's in heaven, so we're all need to go to heaven when we die. And that's used by a number of, of denominations, particularly evangelicals, but even mainstay Christianity, believe that when we die, we go to heaven. And this is one of the verses that's used. Great is your reward in heaven. So what I want to do is just go through those five different sequences and let's see what, what the scripture tells us so the first one was just read the word itself try to get the feeling from, from the word itself so what do we know the reward is in heaven that's fairly clear isn't it the reward is in heaven so that's fine Okay. Bible logic well the reward is in heaven it's fairly clear, it's fairly straightforward we don't need to read anything into it let's just read the scriptures as it says now there are two possibilities there aren't there the reward's in heaven, therefore you've got to go to heaven to get it. That would be one reasonable assumption, a possibility. Or, what if the reward comes to you? The reward is in heaven, but it's coming to you. The two possibilities there, either could be true, couldn't they? If you're going to be completely unbiased and, and look at the scriptures. When we look at verse 3 and verse 10, I'll put them on the screen. 
Jesus says that, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the reward he's speaking of. Again, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now you might think, well, it's the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom in heaven. But again, in the Greek there, if we're going to be fair and ba balanced, it's not there. So the best we can read is the reward is a heavenly kingdom. So what's the immediate context then? We have, we have two viewpoints here. The reward's in heaven. It's a heavenly kingdom. Do we go there or does it come to heaven itself, to the earth itself? Well, let's look at the immediate context. What does Matthew 5 verse 5 say? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's just in a few verses, isn't it, around what we're looking at. So we say, if you take out the verse out of context and say to people, your reward's in heaven, you could get a, a misunderstanding, couldn't you? When you read the scripture itself, the context, you actually find that the meek, their reward, shall inherit the earth. So what we find then, yes, it's a heavenly kingdom. It's coming from God. It's coming from heaven. But it's got to be upon the earth. And that's what the immediate context, I think, has, has reasonably proved, hasn't it? When we look at over the page, verses 33 to 35, Jesus speaks further. He's talking about swearing, swearing an oath. He said it's better not to, because you get yourself into all sorts of difficulties. But he says, verse 33, Again you've heard that, heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not swear, forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. We talk about a heavenly kingdom. A kingdom requires a king, doesn't it? So we can see here that the meek are going to inherit the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be king upon the earth, the scriptures tell us from other parts. And the city of the king is Jerusalem. So that fits in, doesn't it, with the meek shall inherit the earth. The reward is going to be upon earth. And the king is going to sit in Jerusalem. So what about the surrounding context then? Well, you don't need to turn this up, but Matthew 16, verse 27. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. Now, we know from Scripture that Jesus went into heaven. But from Acts chapter 1, we're told he's going to come back again. And this is what this verse is talking about. Jesus Christ is in heaven. He is the reward for us. He's coming back in the glory of his Father. And then he shall give the reward. The meek shall inherit the earth. But again, it's according to a man's works as well. So we need to understand truth, don't we? Another reference there to get the surrounding context. We've gone a bit further out from this, this verse in Matthew 5. But just look at, look at the same points there. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, consistent teaching. Then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory in Jerusalem. Before him shall be gathered all nations. So we, we see quite clearly, the thrones on the earth, that all the nations are going to be gathered to him. They're not in heaven. There's no nations going to heaven. And no church teachings that. Only the, the faithful go to heaven. So clearly it's upon earth and all nations are going to be upon earth. And then we have the judgment seat. We have the analogy of the sheep and the goats. The sheep inherit the kingdom. The last, the last verse there. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. This is the reward, the kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. Prepare for you from the foundation of the world, or the beginning, if you like, of the book of Genesis, when God prepared the world. So that's the surrounding context. <coughs> What about the Old Testament then? We need to prove it from the Old Testament as well. Well, let's just turn up Psalm 115, if you would. We've seen the surrounding context locally in Matthew. Now we're going to go wider context of the whole Bible and just see if we get the same message. And you can make your own judgments whether we have or whether we haven't. Psalm 115. Verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. So the heaven, which is his, foot, his, 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 um, his throne, as we saw from Matthew, that's God's, clearly that's God's. But he's given the earth to the children of men. The meek shall inherit the earth. Again, it's quite clear, isn't it? Just look at Daniel chapter 2, another New Testament prophecy, prophet rather. If we just turn there, again, just, want to, just to establish this point that it's clearly upon the earth. We've had many uh, subjects on Daniel chapter 2 and 
and the and the image there. But we just want to pick up the context of of some words there in Daniel two verse forty four, at the end of this prophecy, when God's kingdom will be established upon the earth. Daniel two says, in the days of these kings, these were the kings of the prophecy, the kings of the earth. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Heaven, kingdom, heavenly kingdom, same thing, isn't it? Which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, to other nations. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these nations, and it shall stand forever. The Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth and will establish his rule. Now, mankind will not submit to that rule. The scriptures are quite clear on that. But he will establish it by, by force. And this is the image that, that Daniel saw. Like I say, we've, we've done many lectures on this, but you can see that the kings go through the kings of this earth, with the various empires, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greeks, the Roman Empire, and to the towns we live in now. We live in fragmented countries in Europe and around the world. There's no particular empire. But it's in the days of these kings that God's kingdom will be established. And we live in, we believe, in that time now. Matthew chapter 8. Eight. Jesus says, I say unto you that many shall come from the east, from the west, and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The promises are, are very well taught from this platform. But all we should say is that one of the promises given to Abraham, or Abraham as his name was then, he was given a physical territory upon this earth. He says, I have given this land from the river of Egypt and to the great river, the river Euphrates. So we can see there, River of Egypt, all the way through to the great river, River Euphrates. Jesus in Matthew starts out the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's going to be Jesus' kingdom where he's going to rule with his disciples. And the whole earth, if you like, will be his empire throughout the rest of the world. So we see quite clearly from scriptures that the meek shall inherit the earth. You shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And we can see behind us, it's certainly not up in the skies, is it? It's upon the earth. Would you turn finally to a few verses here? Just to corroborate the things that we're saying. The Apostle Paul is writing to a young believer, Timothy, and he gives him words of encouragement for how he should encourage himself and encourage others. And it's what we've been, hopefully, putting across to you this evening. He encourages him to study thyself, sorry, rather, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Which is what we try to do with those five steps to understanding biblical truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth, that we might obtain truth. Not what we think we'd like to believe, not what we've been taught to believe, but what the Bible actually tells us we should believe. Another translation it, um, is a bit more clearer perhaps, or perhaps gives a better understanding. Rightly dividing the word, accurately handling the word of truth. Jesus, when he was at the well in Samaria, he gives, uh, has a conversation with the woman at the well. And he makes the important distinction. She was a Samaritan. She believed many things which were loosely based upon the original beliefs of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Jesus said to her, you worship, you know not what. And that's pretty much the state which we find in many of the religions today. They're not using the word of God. They have many biblical teachings but a lot of them have been put set aside by church traditions or traditions of the elders of that group. And so they have a form of godliness, but not according to truth. And it's very much the similar time that Jesus found with the woman at the well. He says quite clearly, we know what we worship for our salvation is of the Jews. Now, that's not a popular thing to say, both in the world at large, nor amongst Christian circles, is it? But Jesus is telling us, the king of the Jews, that salvation is of the Jews. And we need to look to the Old Testament, the promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's where salvation is found. And again he says, the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. That's almost identical to the words that Joshua said to the people when they were going to go into the promised land, millennia before the time of Jesus. Exactly the same truth, and exactly the same um, regard for sincerity and truth. Because God is a spirit. He's not a man that we should worship him. 
is worship as a God, as the truth. That's why we worship God, because he's a God of truth. And all of his followers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's just go find our final reference to Revelation 22. The final message of the Lord Jesus Christ sent through his angels about those things which must come shortly come to pass. Jesus Christ is going to come as king. And what does he say? Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. And the judgment, the reward, will be based upon the words that we've read tonight. So I hope you found it interesting, and that it's important that we look at the word of God and we establish for ourselves what truth is, because the truth, as Jesus said, will set you free.